Hello everybody and welcome to Live at the Museum. My name's Deborah Hill and I work in the touring team right here at the National Museum of Australia. Uh, I would like to first acknowledge country. We would like to acknowledge that we are on the, tradi the traditional country of Ngunnawal, Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples and we honour their elders past, present and emerging. We'd also extend that respect to any and all First Nations people present and joining us via the live stream today, so welcome. Now, today's program, I'm pleased to be sitting here with two very impressive women. Uh, firstly, Chrissy Goldrick, who is Editor-in-Chief of the Australian Geographic magazine and Chair of the Advisory Committee of the Australian Geographic Society. Each year, Chrissy and the team produce a major coffee table book and A Portrait of Australia, the exhibition that I'm sitting in today with them, was created to celebrate 30 years of Australian Geographic and has been turned into this amazing exhibition. It's great to have you here today, Chrissy. Thank you. Also here is Frances Mopnick. Now, Frances has been photographing people in the Australian landscape for titles including Australian Geographic Ma Magazine for over 20 years. Uh, her awards include the Australian Geographic Medal for the Pursuit of Excellence in Photography, the Walkley Award and the Leica Documentary Award for her series, The Night, the Night That Follows Day. <laughs> Her work also featured in a major exhibition here in Canberra only a few years ago in 2007 called Reveries, which for those of you in Canberra, you may have seen. Thanks for joining us, Francis. Thank you. Now, Chrissy, the National Museum of Australia and Australian Geographic uh, came together to turn a book into a show. Would you like to tell us a little bit about it? Yes, well, as you referred to earlier, this uh, a book called A Portrait of Australia uh, was created by ours at Australian Geographic in 2016 to celebrate our 30th birthday. And we thought, what better way to celebrate a birthday than with a beautiful book of photographs? Uh, but actually, it was the best stories from 30 years of storytelling in Australian Geographic. So we, um, we proceeded to put the book together, um, published it, called it A Portrait of Australia, and some, some of the staff here at the National Museum of Australia saw the book, uh, recognised that in some ways the book was doing a similar job to the museum here, which is to tell Australian stories, to, to reflect Australia back to the Australian people. So um, I was contacted and I came down here for a meeting. And a couple of years later, uh, we came up with this exhibition uh, and it's been incredibly successful. It's on here at the National Museum, which is where we are today, but it's also an exhibition that can show in many different venues uh, all at the same time. Uh, and it's just, it's been really remarkably popular. And we're so proud of the collaboration between Australian Geographic and the National Museum. And it's just wonderful sit, to sit here in this sort of three-dimensional version of that book and uh, by extension of Australian Geographic's uh, 30 years of storytelling. Thanks, Chrissy. Um, now, I, do, I would like to encourage our audience uh, to put any questions you might have in comments boxes on Facebook or YouTube or MySpace or wherever you're watching. Kidding. Um, we're about to, we'll now take you through a pre recorded interview and tour of the exhibition with Chrissy. So enjoy, and we'll see you in a moment. The Portrait of Australia was conceived as a way of celebrating 30 years of publishing with Australian Geographic. Uh, back in 2016, we sort of had this idea to do a book of all the best stories from 30 years of publishing. Uh, and of course, the most important storytelling tool that we have is our photography. This is really a story of Australia's rural and remote and regional areas over 30 years from the lenses of very different photographers who have very different ways of interpreting the landscape or taking portraits of people. Uh, and it was this very beautiful portrait that was starting to emerge of, of these amazing places, beautiful remote parts of Australia and the communities and the people that make them tick. And those are not your airbrushed celebrity faces. These are the sort of faces that you find in magazines like ours. These are the real Australians out there doing it tough. So 
So it's got a lot of the kind of themes that you might associate with rural and regional Australia. There's a lot of red dirt there, there are a lot of cattle drives, there's a lot of Akubra hats and windmills in the sunset, those kind of iconic symbols of the outback. People really do respond to those ideas. That is a, a, an idea that we have of ourselves as Australians and we, you know, a lot of us never get to see those kind of places where most of us live in the city. Um, so these are places that maybe we aspire to go to or places that we dream of visiting. Um, and so these photographs really do kind of depict, it's almost an idealised uh, version of Australia, but when you read the stories that go with these photographs, there are a lot of different stories here. There are, there, there are stories of battling and of stories of hardship, but stories of, of, of resilience and, and a bit of Aussie larrikin spirit in there as well. So it's really a kind of a, a, encapsulates a lot of different themes. We do use the best photographers in Australia, so this, uh, the book was a distillation of 30 years of publishing in the magazine and the exhibition is yet another distillation of the book, so really it is the best of the best uh, of, in terms of the photographers and of the photographs that are here in the exhibition. It's not trying to do too many different things, it's just trying to be a true reflection but obviously in the hands of these expert photographers who really know how to take beautiful photographs, how to really frame these photographs and how to work with our amazing Australian light and the natural colours that we have in the landscape. They are so sort of visually attractive, they're so bright, they're so saturated. Those colours, the red, uh, the blue, big blue skies, the green, the gold, all of those things, the blue of the sea, they're, they're really beautifully reflected right through these photographs. And I think that just looking at those colours sort of lifts the spirit. And what we've seen is when we watch people go around this exhibition, we see them stop at different photographs. It's not like there's one or two that everyone stops at and talks about. These pictures talk to people in different ways and in a language that appeals to them or they see something in there that's familiar and, uh, and they, they'll stand there for quite a long time and, and have a discussion. And, you know, you don't get that crowd round one. People are always spread out around the exhibition. There's different things appealing to different people. There are familiar things. There are places they may have been. There are people that look like someone they know. Welcome back. Uh, we hope you enjoyed that insight into A Portrait of Australia with Chrissy. Um, just before we go on, I'd just like to issue a correction that Francis's Walkley and Leica Awards were nominations um, as opposed to awards, uh, just for uh, future reference. So I want to encourage um, the audience again to put in any questions you might have or whatever you might be thinking or want to add to our conversation here today. So Chrissy, I'd like to throw a question at you first up. With social media and photography all around us, do you think people still value it in the same way? I think that a really great photograph will still cut through. Um, and I think that, you know, we, we, we see things that, I suppose, go viral uh, on social media when it's a really great shot. Uh, so I think that the fact that we are completely immersed in photography, it's all around us all the time, hasn't kind of um, in the orders to what is really uh, something that, speaks to people, something that really captures a moment. We talk about capturing moments in photography. Uh, and I think the popularity of exhibitions like this, uh, photo competitions, um, and just still reading uh, magazines like Australian Geographic, which are known for their photography, shows that people still um, love to see or love to enjoy sort of a really great image. Uh, and people know the difference between a good image and an ordinary image. Uh, I think one of the great things about social media is that everybody can be a photographer these days and you can be published. I mean, you know, in the days of when a lot of these pictures were made, it was really pretty a, a, an elite area to be a published photographer. Uh, and that's something that's really changed. But like I say, a great photograph and a great photographer will still you know, come to the top. Uh, but I think it's very good uh, that people can take photographs and 
put them out there where they can be appreciated by a large audience through things like Instagram. So in some ways, they're always looking for inspiration as well for what makes a great photograph. And that's why it's still really important, you know, that photography is, is produced, that it's produced at a high level and that it's printed it really importantly uh, at, also at that, with that quality and with all of those things in place. Mm, that's really interesting because I think one of the other aspects that's really important is the longevity of images and as Chrissy was saying things like Instagram have enabled a vast range of people to become publishers and photographers themselves which is really fantastic but one of the extraordinary things about the collection that we've got here today is that these images have endured for 30 years in some cases, so it's, it's what a, an image records, a time and a place and how um, it's treated across, across time. And I think that's right, and I think with social media, an image can be there one day and gone the next, so there's sort of a disposable quality about images. Uh, and I, I often find myself wondering what, what will, when we look back in 100 years, where are the photographs gonna be that tell us what, how people lived at this time? So it's also really important um, that we do recognise what are those photographs that really do that job, that, that reflect back the way we live, that have a, a very strong element of truth in them about the way we live today, and that we make sure that, that we may allow that to happen, that we allow people to take those photographs, that we collect them, that, that we, you know, we, we do these things with them so that they can stand the test of time. Mm. And, a lot of really great <laughs> photographs could just disappear as well mm. in the way that we, we use them today. That also um, comes down to very astute editing and thinking deeply about what an image signifies um, and what it communicates and what it will communicate to future generations. Yeah. Mm. Now, Francis, something that's been on my mind as a photographer who's been working with Australian Geographic for decades, how does your assignment arrive? Does it come by a carrier pigeon or <laughs> exploding disc? How? How does it happen? It's a very good question. Um, it generally forms in two ways. It either comes from a phone conversation, um, Chrissy or a writer will ring me up and ask me, am I interested in a certain topic? Or on many occasions I've approached a strange geographic with um, story ideas that I'm particularly interested in and I feel that are relevant to the publication. And do you have any examples or favourite assignments that you've had over the years? Well, an, um, an image for my very first assignment is actually hanging in this show. And so it's lovely to reconnect with uh, the Curdy Merka Outback Ball. It's a, desert, it's a story that takes place in the Australian desert in a small place called Curdy Merka, which is a railway siding. Um, it's literally in the middle of nowhere. And every two years, um, a lovely gentleman called Simon Coxon organises a dance, a black tie dance, in the middle of nowhere to raise funds for the Curdy Merka Outback Ball. And this was my very first assignment in 1996. And I just have to jump in there and say that actually that assignment, Francis, uh, predates me in the company. So I've been working for Australian Geographic for 22 years, but Francis has been there for longer than I have. And I came to the magazine, and this is one of the first stories that I saw printed in the magazine. And to me, it sort of encapsulated so much about Australia. And it was that whole idea. I mean, I love, everyone loves a sunset. We still love a sunset. But it's got so much going on in it, and it's just the, the, the whole idea that it's the outback, it's those big, big Australian skies. Uh, there's a railway line in that photograph disappearing into the distance. There's a water tank, there's the Akubra hats, uh, and the fact is that people are out there you know, in one of these, I think they used to call them bachelor and spinster balls, that's I think where they came out of. But this is a real outback, iconic outback event, and this picture just, tells it all, tells the, the whole story, and then goes on to tell the whole story over a number of pages. But to be able to capture that in one image, I was very blown away by this when I first came to work there. Oh, thanks, Chrissy. It's, it's also really interesting, the points that you raise about that image, because on assignment, you're always in pursuit of the opening shot. It's a, always a double page spread. It needs to sort of encapsulate the entire essence of the story in one image um, so that people looking to read the story are drawn in. But you also need to consider when you're creating the image um, compositional elements that are outside of the, the photograph like strap lines and headlines and how they'll place on a What's page. What's a strap line? 
A strap line tells the reader a little bit more. It's a teaser. So oh. you've, got a, you've got a header, so the credit maker out back ball. I can't remember what the strap line was, but it's a little teaser to get people to, gotcha. to read further. So there's actually a lot involved in, in, when, in creating an image for AG. Well, and how do you know you've got that shot? Well, this is quite fascinating because um, when I started with Australian Geographic, we were still shooting on transparency film in the middle of the desert. So there's a whole range of logistical issues to deal with in terms of keeping the film safe and at the right temperature. And also, you don't know if you've got the shot. So the great thing about shooting on film was that we were always chasing the ultimate image. Amazing. So there's a few questions coming in, and I have one from Heidi on Facebook. Hi, Heidi. Um, how did you shortlist for the exhibition? Now, Chrissy, this is kind of a you question, and I observed some of this process, and I would say with great difficulty. Yes. <laughs> well, with great difficulty indeed. And in fact, uh, trying to choose this, we, we could put 60 stories in the book, and the book is the, the, was the, um, where the exhibition came out of. To try and choose 60 stories in the first place from 30 years of publishing was very, very difficult indeed. Uh, um, I could have gone on and done the, another 10 books. But anyway, some stories, as I say, um, you know, the, the, the pictures are very, they're, they're very vibrant. They, they, they represent uh, Australia in a certain way. Uh, and when we were um, trying to decide which stories went into the book, um, most people do associate wildlife and landscapes with Australian Geographic. Uh, but once we started to sort of look at the stories and look at the photographs that went with them, it was another story really that started to come to the surface uh, for the book. And it was really the way in which Australian Geographic's photographers and writers had covered uh, communities, people, Australians and Australian communities that became like the strongest storytelling over the 30 years. And um, so in some ways, the book, the, the whole project shifted and changed and it became uh, a story of Australia's people and in particular, the people beyond the cities. Most of us live in the cities, but um, Australian Geographic really works very hard to cover places beyond the cities, places that don't necessarily, and certainly back in the 80s and the 90s, didn't really feature uh, anywhere near as much as the cities. So. Um, our photographers and our writers crisscross the whole country um, and a, a sort of st a picture of, of Australia kind of emerges from that uh, and that really was um, sort of the editing process for the book and then also for the exhibition it was um, uh, the exhibition is themed uh, into these themes uh, including bush outback coast uh, and then a, a, an exploration of who we are. So the book sort of naturally fell into those kind of into those themes, big big themes, big generalised themes. Um, so really, uh, the process after that was which are the photographs that, that that tell that story of Australia most strongly. So you know that's why we've got photographs in here of what people do for a living in in country in rural and regional Australia, whether that is obviously uh, agriculture and farming. Uh, mining, fishing, um, so you know that really informed the choice. But uh, obviously, at the end of the day, it's it's what are the photographs that are just beautiful and and tell the story, but also are really arresting and stand alone in their own right. Mm. Now, just to bring it back to me, Francis, <laughs> I'd like to ask you a very selfish question. Um, can you talk to us a bit more about some of the images that you've taken in the show? And I'm hoping you're going to talk about my favourite image. Which one's that? Which is <laughs> the child swimming um, in Coogee. And that's my favourite image because I just love the colours, I love the movement, I love underwater photography. So can you tell us a little bit more about that one? Mm, absolutely. Um, so that was created in the process of doing a story on um, the nippers, a learn to swim pr program that we have in Australia. It's a, it's a very unique program. Um, and so we worked together to tell that story and we told it uh, across the country. And one of the very interesting things about working with Australian Geographic is that they don't necessarily send the person who is most um, adapt in terms of, like, let's just say this image here, I'm not a strong swimmer. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I get this story that I'm extremely interested in and the reality is I'm going to have to get out there in the waves with these kids who are all better swimmers than I am. I'm also going to have to wrangle my camera gear, which at that time was um, digital 
camera inside a massive, big, clunky dry housing that I used to have to take out, out and dry off every time I had to change the data card. So um, it was a challenge on every level, but it was, I think it makes the images more interesting, um, both in the production of them, but also for the viewers, because I don't fall back onto sort of stereotypical or a bag of tricks that, some photo that people can develop over time. Um, but it's a beautiful image, it's really powerful, these young kids who are out there in these huge waves and they're learning how to survive in our very harsh environment and it's such a unique program. Yeah, the confidence, the confidence really strikes me in that image. Mm. Um, but I did also want to ask, do, like, did you, did you know you had that shot or were you thinking, I'm going to have to get back in the water again or how many times, how many times do you go through that process? Like that, there's a lot of discomfort potentially you in just, that. With these types of assignments, um, you are capturing a real event, something that's happening. So you just keep working for as long as the light or the subjects permit. You keep pushing because um, you may think you have the image, but you may not. And something better might also come along. You, may, you think quite often I've thought, oh, I've got the opening spread image. It's fantastic. It's great. But later that day, something else amazing happens and, and there's the image and it's a process of continually challenging yourself and, and pushing yourself to get yet another image. Yeah. And I, with that, just going back to that assignment with Frances, as you can see, we do literally throw her in the deep end. <laughs> something like that to be done. But um, one of the nippers clubs that Frances covered was actually at Jindabyne. That was fabulous. So whilst that was uh, that photograph that we're talking about is taken on Coogee Beach, and it may well have been at a, quite a nice time of the year when the water may not have been so cold, we did then actually <laughs> send her up to the Snowy <laughs> Mountains to photograph uh, in a very, very cold part of Australia. Which which is a really fantastic contrast to probably the more stereotypical images that people may think of when they think of the Nippers training program. Photographing um, Nippers training on a lake was really extraordinary. And on that day, I remember we had these like really dramatic storm clouds and the lake, the water was dark and moody. And it was, it was really fantastic on so many different levels. And these kids training on a lake to then go down to the coastal areas and compete against kids who train in coastal conditions. It's, it's just, um, it was really quite an extraordinary component to the story. Mm. So uh, I've got a question from Holly on Facebook. Hi, Holly. Um, Francis, do you prefer landscapes or portraits or animals as subjects? Hi, Holly. Um, I love people in the landscape. That's what I find really interesting and that's what I've really enjoyed engaging with Australian Geographic. Um, I, like peop I like seeing what people do in extraordinary places. I love meeting people who fall outside of the orbits that are covered by other publications. And people have such extraordinary t stories and they're often, these play out in incredible environments. And there's such a breadth and, and depth to the experiences that are in Australia. And that's what I really love to photograph and, and bring to, to readers. Um, thanks, Francis. As, as we sit here on our uh, socially distanced couch, um, I'd like to just ask you, Chrissy, um, how has the pandemic and, and affected the way Australian Geographic is operating in terms of, I guess, travel's not as easy and things like that? H how's that working? It's a good question. Um, I, I guess the thing is that we tend to work quite a long way ahead. So I, I, we've yet to see the full effect um, of the lockdowns over the last uh, year, almost a year now. Uh, but one of the things that we tend to do is that our photographers, as you'll hear from Francis, is that our photographers will cover the whole country for one story. So they'll be flying um, right across, you know, they'll, they'll be in three different states for one single story. So um, it's, we obviously haven't been able to do that in the last year. So what we're doing is we're, uh, using new photographers uh, that we're looking for in particular parts of the country. Um, and what we've always tried to do in the past is to have the one photographer covering a story right across the country so that we've got that consistent aesthetic, that consistent eye of that photographer in telling that story. But we have been unable to do that in the last year. So now on any particular story, you may have three different photographers in three different parts of the, of the, of the country covering that uh, particular topic. So that will sort of reflect a bit of a change in the way that the stories look on the page. Um, it, it means that we've been introduced to a lot more photographers that we didn't perhaps know before, which is, that, and that's always a good thing. 
Um, also, our storytelling um, has been reflected in the magazine. So, you know, COVID has meant that for many people, they can no longer travel to the places that we like to cover. So, we, you know, we had to be a little, a little bit careful about, you know, inciting people to, you know, get in the car or get on a plane and go somewhere that's beautiful and we think that they should go and visit it when they can't. So, definitely the storytelling has reflected that. Uh, one of the things I have heard, uh, and coming back to this exhibition, is that when we first started with this exhibition, it was this um, almost like retrospective of 30 years um, of uh, story pict pictorial storytelling uh, through Australian Geographic. Uh, but people are sort of interpreting it slightly differently now, and because Australians can only really go to Australia, uh, at the moment and in the, in the next year. It's almost really like a travelogue now. People are coming in here and going, ah, oh, you know, because everyone's looking for somewhere else to go, somewhere new that they haven't visited. And perhaps uh, there's been a real upsurge in interest in Australia from Australians. So uh, the, 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 it's interesting to see the exhibition itself being reinterpreted in the light of COVID-19. Mm, thanks, Chrissy. So we are starting to come to the end of the program today, um, but we do have time for a few more questions. So keep asking them, and uh, even if we run out of time with Chrissy and Francis, uh, they'll still be answered online. So Holly from Facebook, you've asked a question of, will the show tour to Adelaide? At this stage, we don't have an Adelaide venue on the itinerary. However, uh, the itinerary is constantly changing and transforming and growing. Uh, and a shout out to Catherine Scher about excellent um, tour manager for this project. Um, at, uh, Catherine, it looks like we need to get Adelaide on the list. Um, but if you are interested in finding out um, where the exhibition's going or where it's been, you can find information on the museum's website and I'll get someone in the team here to post a link for everybody so that you can easily find that. Um, I've got another question from Sam on black and white photography often adds texture and drama, says Sam. Uh, does the exhibition use any such pictures? Well, in Australian Geographic in the magazine, we very rarely use black and white photography. Um, that is a sort of an aesthetic uh, decision, a design decision that we made right at the outset um, when the magazine was first set up, that we would reflect uh, the country of Australia in all of its glorious colours um, and that is something that we still do today so uh, we want to reflect the, the the country back to people as they see it with their own eyes so they see it in colour so we've, we, we do um, stick with colour which doesn't mean to say that there haven't been some black and white stories that we've done over the years and in fact two of perhaps the most significant black and white uh, uh, assignments that we had were shot by Francis. Um, they were a real departure from our usual storytelling, but they were really important stories that we told. Uh, and, and they were, they were the, the two sides of the same coin. It was a story about death in Australia and a story about birth in Australia. And uh, black and white was the chosen uh, format for that because it, it suited uh, the storytelling right. and, and the subject matter. And Francis can tell us a little bit more about yeah, that. Yeah, well, Francis, you okay. use black and white photography a lot in your practice. Is, would that be correct? Yeah, I do. And as Chrissy said, it was a real departure for Australian Geographic and it really heralded and um, re it it really heralded a different style of storytelling for the for the journal. Um, we did a piece on this uh, title called, uh, I think it was titled The Night That Follows Day, An Australian Experience of Death and Dying, followed by a very uplifting story on birth, which is called Birth Days in Australia. Um, and we used black and white photography specifically to focus viewers' attentions on the emotions um, that were captured within the images and to tell a story that departed quite significantly from the very colourful, very celebratory, not that these two pieces were not celebratory, um, but just wanted to mark a departure and we, we chose black and white for that reason. Mm. Uh, another question from Facebook from Masimba. Um, Chrissy, this is for you. Mm. How do you hire photographers? Um, well, <laughs> a lot of the photographers that we've been using right through the whole history of the magazine are still working for us. Um, so, um, and that's great because um, 
They're extremely experienced uh, and they really know what Australian Geographic wants when they go out in the field. Uh, there's a big difference in photography and, and a lot of people do a lot of beautiful uh, standalone pictures for their you know, photo, comp photo competitions and Instagram and all those kind of things. But it's a, it's, it's mm -hmm. a, a different skill to tell a story through photography, to be a photojournalist, uh, and it, it, it's, not, it's not easy, is it's what I'd say. It's incredibly demanding, and it's very different to what people expect. Um, there's nothing remotely relaxing about it. Um, you, you are in incredible spaces, and you're there for incredibly limited amounts of time, and you need to be cognizant of the story, the actuality of your environment and communicating that. It's incredibly, surprisingly, incredibly demanding. So actually the people that are really at the top of their game in photojournalism and storytelling are few and far between in fact. So um, we come out six times a year. And so there's not a huge amount of work to be had for, through Australian Geographic. Um, so, like I say, we're using a lot of the same photographers we've used through the years, but that's not to say that we're not always looking for new talent. I, I, I'll make this um, claim now, and you probably won't believe me, but every time somebody does email me with their portfolio or their website, I do look. Uh, and the reason I look is I'm just always looking for the next big star of photography. That could be you. <laughs> so I'm not giving you my email, by the way. <laughs> but um, always on the lookout for new talent. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a tougher field these days. It's a tough job to be a photographer. Photography's changed so much. It's very hard to make a living out of photography these days. And photographers have really had to pivot, to use that uh, term, uh, and take on a whole lot of other skills uh, besides. Um, but yes, I do, if you contact me, I will look at your work and you may well ne be the next cover photographer. For <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, thanks Chrissy. Uh, so we have time for one last question and that's coming from Holly uh, via Facebook. Hi Holly. So Holly's question, uh, which I'm going to direct at you, Chrissy. firstly. Uh, so Australia is constantly changing multiculturally. Um, how does the exhibition reflect the changing population over the past 30 years? Yeah, well, I think what I'll go back to say is that it is uh, almost like a, a, a historical piece because it's 30 years uh, and it, it, was, it, it went up to the year 2016 or really probably about 2014. So it's from its time and it reflects uh, storytelling over that period and that is a lot of storytelling and this is a, a, a distillation of that. Uh, I'd say that if we were to do another uh, similar book in the next 10 years, it's evolving. The storytelling is evolving. Australia changes all of the time. How we see ourselves and how we talk about ourselves is constantly changing. So. Um, it, it is a, as, a, as we say, it is a portrait of Australia. It's not the portrait of Australia. We would not uh, lay claim to anything uh, as ambitious as that. Um, and it certainly reflects uh, the way in which we were living in those regional uh, areas in that time. Mm. Uh, as I say, even Australian Geographic, it, we've, we've, the conversation has changed for us. We, we focus in a lot more now on issues related to climate change and the environment uh, and our custodianship of the land uh, and our uh, First Nations people and, uh, and, the, and the need to give voice to the First Nations uh, people of Australia. So the, the story is constantly changing. In 30 years time, it will be a very different exhibition. Mm, excellent. So just a final question from me to both of you. Francis, what's the best thing about a job with Australian Geographic? The adventure. You have to be good at what you do, you have to be a solid photographer, but what it comes down to is that Australian Geographic has provided me with an opportunity to adventure across Australia many times and in depth and meet extraordinary people who do extraordinary things. And Chrissy, how about you? Well, I was just going back to the adventure. The adventure is also an adventure for those of us who are sitting in the office. <laughs> <laughs> we like to travel vicariously, as we say. Well, we've all been doing a bit of that <laughs> these days, haven't we? But um, one of the things we do when we're briefing the photography is that we don't overly brief the mm. photographers. So I guess what we're always looking for is when they go out and we know that they will go and you know do a fantastic job and 
uh, and be very professional about it. We're looking for something we didn't know. Mm -hmm. We're looking for the story that we didn't brief and we're looking for the, photographer, the photographs that we didn't expect. And the photographers constantly, you know, surprise us in that way. Um, and we, we don't, you know, we don't overly prescribe what it is that we want. We know the photographers like Francis know exactly how a story is put together on the page. They know both sides of the, the ledger, as it were. And, um, but we're just always looking for the story that we hadn't anticipated when we're sitting there at our desks in, the, in, the, in our ivory towers in the city. So that's, that's mm. the, the serendipitous nature of it that we really love. And that's so important because that is why we're able to capture what's actually happening, to have that. We have an umbrella brief, but we're doing investigative work in the field and we're bringing back things that hopefully delight and surprise and inform. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Chrissy, Francis, for joining us today. And thanks to all of you for joining us live at the museum. Portrait of Australia is on display here at the museum until the 8th of March. And I believe it's also concurrently on display in Charters Towers um, at the World Theatre. Um, also going to Lavington Library in Albury and seen at Swansea in Lake Macquarie. Um, so that's all for now. Thanks, everybody.